Hey guys, welcome to subtopic 2.3 on optimizing production. These will be our first science understandings. Designing chemical synthesis processes involve constructing reaction pathways that may include more than one chemical reaction. Also, the steps in industrial chemical processes can be conveniently displayed in flowcharts. You'll need to be able to interpret flowcharts and use them for such purposes as identifying raw materials, chemicals present at different steps in the process, waste products and byproducts. So firstly, let's talk about the chemical industry. It's essential for the production of over 50,000 different types of chemicals or different types of products. These can include things such as metals, solvents, plastics, polymers, as well as fertilizers. So it's a massive industry with large amounts of money being pumped into it, large amounts of profits as well. To determine how a certain material is produced, Manufacturers look at using what we call a flowchart. So flowcharts start off with firstly various stages. These represent different physical and chemical processes that try to convert starting materials into a final product. In order to do this, we would firstly need raw materials. We can define raw materials as starting materials that are converted through chemical and physical processes that are designed to try and make a final product. We can also have what we call byproducts. So we can see byproduct one is produced in stage four and can be put back into stage two. Um, and we also have byproduct two, which is produced in stage three. Byproducts are products other than the final product, which have some type of commercial value. So this means that they can be used within the same process, or they could essentially be sold off um, for profit. Another type of product we could produce is a waste product. So in this case, we've got waste product one in stage two, waste product two in stage four. And these types of products have essentially no commercial value. And this can be at a cost to the manufacturer because they will need to find a way to discard and that often requires money. All of this is then designed to essentially form our final product. We've got an example here of a flowchart and this is for what we call the harbour process, which is involved in the manufacturing of ammonia. And we know ammonia can be used for things such as fertilisers and explosives. To look at this, we can break it down into those different types of uh, materials. So up the top here, we can see we've got natural gas, steam and air as our raw materials. These are essentially being fed into the process and we would see them as arrows pointing into a certain process of the flowchart. In terms of byproducts, we can actually see that the flowchart has told us that carbon dioxide is a byproduct and it can be used as a reactant for other chemical processes. We can't seem to find any waste products in this flowchart. However, we know that there are things like spent catalysts, so catalysts which do get used up and essentially need to be replaced so they end up forming one of our waste products. For the remainder of the video, we're now going to consider this science understanding. Industrial processes are designed to maximize profit and to minimize impact on the environment. You need to explain how certain reaction conditions represent a compromise that will give maximum yield in a short time. Also explain the impact of increases in temperature and pressure on manufacturing conditions and costs and on the environment. Finally, explain how the use of a catalyst may benefit both manufacturer and the environment. These are some considerations that need to be made by a manufacturer. In order to produce a certain product, we want the rate of reaction to be reasonably high. We would like the yield to be also reasonably high. We would want to keep costs to a minimum and also looking at the environmental impact to a minimum. We're going to now consider why manufacturers would like to use high temperatures and pressures in their production processes. To start off, looking at increasing temperatures, we know that this is going to help increase the rate of chemical processes. As a downside, this is going to increase cost because in order for manufacturers to increase temperature, they're going to need to seek methods like burning fossil fuels as a source of energy to try and bring the temperature up. 
In terms of the effect on the yield, well, this really depends on the nature of the reaction. And we learnt from subtopic 2.2 that if we have an endothermic reaction, then increasing temperature is going to increase the yield, whereas if it's an exothermic reaction, this is going to decrease the yield. In regards to an increase in pressure, we're going to see similar aspects. So this will result in an increase in the rate of reaction for gaseous systems. Using higher pressures is going to use more expensive machinery to generate these higher pressures. This is going to increase the cost. And in terms of the effect on the yield, well, again, this depends on the nature of the reaction. And what we're doing is we're looking at the number of moles of reactants versus products. If the number of moles of reactants is greater than the products, then we would know using Le Chatelier's principle that yield will increase. On the flip side, if the number of moles of reactants is less than the products, then the yield is going to decrease. Given that high temperatures and pressures could be used in manufacturing processes, you'd also have to think about the effect that this can have on the environment. The use of high temperatures and pressures is going to increase the manufacturer's energy demands. And in Australia in particular, we know that most of our energy comes from the combustion of fossil fuels. Through the combustion of fossil fuels, we know that this can contribute to problems such as the enhanced greenhouse effect. This can then contribute to global warming and climate change. It could also increase the production of photochemical smog and even result in the formation of acid rain. We know that companies are facing increased pressures to try and minimise their impact on the environment. So this often comes at a cost to the manufacturer. We're now going to consider the contact process as an example, where we're going to look at the ideal conditions that will help maximise yield, but we'll end up comparing it to the actual conditions that are used. The contact process is used in the production of sulfuric acid. One of the key processes involves taking sulfur dioxide gas, reacting it with oxygen in air to produce sulfur trioxide gas. We can summarise this process using this thermochemical equation here. So two lots of SO2 reacts with one lot of O2 to produce two lots of SO3. We have a delta H value which is equal to negative 196 kilojoules per mole. This indicates that it is a, an exothermic reaction in the forward direction. So using this information here, as well as this graph to the right, we would find that the ideal conditions to maximise yield are going to be low temperatures. So looking at this diagram to the left, we can see that the percentage of sulphur dioxide converted to sulphur trioxide, so in other words, that's the percentage yield, is going to be at its highest at lower temperatures, and we can see that it decreases in yield at high temperatures. Based on the balanced chemical equation, we know that also high pressures are going to be favoured to try and increase the yield. Given that this system would be in equilibrium, then if we use high pressures, the system will want to try and reduce pressures by favouring the reaction that has less moles or favouring the side with less moles. We can see that the left side has more moles than the right side, so in other words, equilibrium will shift to the right at high pressures. In terms of the actual conditions, this is what we have. We have temperatures, we would say that these are relatively high temperatures of 400 to 450 degrees Celsius. We actually have fairly low pressures of one to two atmospheres. In addition to this, we look at using vanadium pentoxide as a catalyst. And the combination of these conditions results in a yield of 99%. How does this come about? Because we, we did say that low temperatures and high pressures will help maximise yield. So the key is looking at this diagram to the right. Firstly, we've looked at adding sulphur dioxide and oxygen in a ratio of 1 to 1. So this is a, a mole ratio of 1 to 1 of sulphur dioxide and oxygen. This results in an excess of oxygen in our reaction vessel. And this excess of oxygen, which will increase its concentration, is going to help shift the equilibrium to the right and result in greater sulfur trioxide production. The reason why these higher temperatures of 400 to 450 degrees Celsius are used are to try and increase the rate of reaction or increase the rate of formation. Given that the yield is 99% already, it doesn't make sense to use higher pressures because the use of higher pressures 
is firstly going to be unsafe and then it's going to be more expensive than the profits that we would gain by that increase in yield. We saw in the contact process that vanadium pentoxide catalyst was used. Many chemical processes look at incorporating some type of catalyst because it does help reduce the need for increased temperatures and pressures designed to try and increase the rate of reactions. Another benefit is that they can often be reused and this is going to help reduce operating costs. But at the same time, we know that catalysts become spent over time and they need to be replaced or reprocessed. That concludes our work on 2.3 optimizing production. I'll see you guys next time.